I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The presidency is rooted in the Constitution, but its modern dimensions, created by political necessity, were never imagined by the Founding Fathers. Understanding the presidency is vitally important in the success of this great democracy. And that is what this program is about. I am Warren Berger, Chairman of the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution. It is a rare occasion in history to have four living former presidents. It has happened only once before when Abraham Lincoln took office. Our commission decided to interview our four former presidents to record and preserve their views about the office of the presidency and the interaction of the president with the other branches of government, uh, with the people, and with the media. Our interviewer and narrator is the distinguished journalist Hugh Seide who began covering presidents during the administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Ronald Reagan, the 40th president, a sportscaster in Iowa, Hollywood actor, and governor of California, wanted to be known as a president who made Americans believe in themselves. He used tax cuts to spur the economy, and he believed in military strength. The Reagan personality, reflecting small-town American values, was also included in the presidential arsenal. I came into office with a belief that the people of this country were hungering for a spiritual revival. In the previous administration, they'd been told over and over again that things would never be as good as they once were, that we would have to resign ourselves to a lower standard and so forth. They, we were told that there was a malaise affecting the country and all of these things. And it was apparent that the people, the citizens of our country, had lost some of that great feeling of pride and patriotism that they had in our government. And I set out, my goal was to restore that. And I think we did. The Constitution has the President and Congress working in tandem in running the government, each performing a task, one acting as a check on the other. A fifth program that I we've avoided. Dave, to say that I think that program is going to save us money in the long haul. I, because starting that early, we're going to make taxpayers out of potential tax eaters. So that's I applaud precisely that decision. Right. I think yeah. it's a wise one. That's but today the government right. is no longer so simple. In modern, complex affairs, the two branches engage in tugs of war as they play their constitutional roles. For President Reagan, the struggle began with the budget. Mr. President, the uh, Constitution, when written, of course, never took into account this huge job of managing the economy. How much of, of your work was devoted to that? How much of being president uh, was consumed by this task. Yes, we tried in every way, but the way the Congress has taken the powers from the presidency, eight times I submitted a budget, which the Constitution says I'm to do, to the Congress, and eight times they just told me it was dead on arrival and put it on a shelf. They couldn't call it a budget. They sent me back what they called a continuing resolution, which was the whole program, budget program, 
in a stack of papers that high, and uh, I did not have the right to go through and veto out things. In that package, I had to accept or veto the whole thing. I couldn't veto it because the whole government would come to a halt. You couldn't even write a paycheck or anything if I vetoed that thing. Yet, uh, we, we label that era of economics as Reaganomics. We did oh. suggest that you had changed the directions. What you're suggesting, I guess, is you didn't get as much as you wanted. You couldn't go as far as you wanted. Well, mainly the Reaganomics, the main thing that caused the increase in our prosperity was the tax program, the tax cuts. They actually enlarged the economy so that there was more, more taxes. Actually, more revenue came in at the lower rates than they'd been getting at those terrible higher rates. Why so large a tax cut, uh, Mr. President? Because some subsequently have suggested that had you made a compromise, perhaps we wouldn't have had the deficits. Oh, <laughs> no, because as I say, those deficits were increasing and, and the Congress that was always um, calling my, uh, my budgets dead, the Congress was responsible for the spending. They automatically sent higher rates of increase in spending than I had asked for. Well, you've said several times you thought basically your economic policy, Reaganomics, was a success that it gave this long period of prosperity, even with the deficits. It not only gave that long prosperity, but in eight years, never in our history, had the economy expanded as much as it had in those eight years. We created almost 20 million new jobs. Now, at the time I took office, unemployment was in double digits. And uh, 20 million new jobs uh, brought quite a bit of prosperity. The tax uh, decreases that I had in mind were also so that if local governments were being starved in something or state governments that they couldn't do that was necessary, now by reducing the rate of federal taxation, they would have a chance maybe uh, for a necessary increase. This was kind of a new emphasis on federalism. We've talked about that actually, yeah. I guess, going back to Mr. Nixon, who called it a new federalism. Let the local people do it more. You had yes. that in mind. Yes, that's what the Constitution called for. See. Did you feel that you had adequate powers for managing the economy? Yes, oh. except that the Congress could overrule anything yeah. that we came up with. The Congress refused to allow us to keep any money in any program that was left over at the end of the year. Now, if we were able to efficiently run a program and still have money left over, well, then that meant we could, that could be added on for the coming for the next year, and you wouldn't have to budget as much uh, to add to it. But the Congress wouldn't let you do it. They had a flat order. You had to spend the money. And they did. That had been appropriated, yes. Is there anything, as you look back on now in a general way, that you would change about the presidency, the office itself, the job? I'm out on the mashed potato circuit now, preaching some things that should be done. Uh, I couldn't get Congress to even listen to them. One was the line item veto. Now the line item veto, you know, the ability to go through a packet of bills and programs and pick things out that you think are extravagant and not in the welfare of the people and veto them. Forty-three governors have that right. I had it when I was governor of California. The Congress will not allow the President of the United States to do that. I think that another thing that Congress always opposed me on was the idea of another amendment to the Constitution that was first suggested by Thomas Jefferson, and that was a provision in the Constitution that prevents the federal government from going into debt. A balanced Maybe. budget yes. amendment, I yeah. see. Mr. President, what's at the heart of this? Is it this divided government we have in which Congress is essentially Democratic, and the White House Republican. Uh, is that part of the problem in which this partisanship sets in and they're determined to yes, overrule so. each other? Very much What do so. we do about that? What can be done? Well, I think it begins with the gerrymandering. 
What I'm talking about is the legislatures of the state and the Congress are the ones who lay out the electoral districts every 10 years based on the changes in population. And that's a conflict of, of interest. They are laying out districts that will guarantee them their re-election. As a matter of fact, in one of the last elections, 98% of the incumbents were re-elected. The gerrymandering is the guarantee it's hard of the a arteries. majority in the House of Representatives in the Congress. Mm -hmm. I think that what we should have is a bipartisan commission that every 10 years lays out the districts based on the interests and the welfare of the people in those districts. The only job where all the people vote for it is the presidency. Now, they must vote for a president on the basis of what he said he'd do, the promises he made. And yet under this system, the same people that by a great majority send a man to the presidency, then go back and vote in their districts and send a Congress up that is pledged to keep him from keeping his promises. Well, you imply from your answers so far that there's been a shift of power under the Constitution, and that the Constitution did not envision a Congress doing so much to inhibit the president. I think that we should change the terms for uh, congressmen to four years instead of two, because at two years, they're constantly running for re-election. They're just elected and they start running for the next election. And the reason it was two years, I believe, if you look at history, is because back in the beginning, Congress wasn't a career. Prominent citizens, successful people, business people and all, would volunteer to give up two years of their life to help and serve in the government. And then they wanted to come back home and say to somebody else, hey, you go up there for two years. But now, over the years, they've built this to a career where someone looks forward to the bulk of his adult life being in the Congress. And um, I think this is one of the reasons why so many people no longer vote. I see. What about, uh, and I think you've talked about this before, the president uh, himself, the limitation is two terms, would you... Now, I'm opposed to the limitation on the number of terms I see. for anything, not only the president, but the others. I think that that is an infringement on the democratic rights of we the people. The people have a right to vote for whoever they want to vote for and for as many times as they want to vote for them. I think it's an infringement on their rights. My own party was responsible for the limitation of terms of the presidency now. That was revenge on... Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt running and being elected four times. No other president had ever tried uh, to be president for more than two terms. That was a kind of a tradition set by Washington after his second term because he said he didn't want anything to happen that would begin to make the presidency look like royalty or like a king. Well then every president after him down through the years just automatically stepped down to two terms. My feeling is that we were wrong in then getting an amendment to the Constitution that limits the president to two terms. In foreign affairs, there are constitutional issues involved which define the powers and limits of the presidency. Grenada is a case in point. During the Reagan administration, a United States military force invaded Grenada, which was governed by Marxists. It was the first major armed intervention by the United States in the Western Hemisphere since 1965. Mr. Reagan gives his reason for the invasion and for the secrecy that went with it. Four o'clock in the morning, I get a telephone call that the governments of some of the Caribbean island states have made a request of me for some support to their military that they were going to attack Grenada because Grenada, a communist government, had seized power in Grenada, had taken over the power there, and they felt that they were next. But they said they didn't believe that they had enough military power, even though they'd make it available, but would need our help. Well, I immediately 
four o'clock in the morning, got on the phone to our own people and um, said, there's no way we can say no to this. You also had a lot of American students over there. 800 they, American some, students some on that island, uh, yes. by that. Yeah, medical yeah. students. Yeah. But the also the thing was, and why this had to be kept secret, was because Cuba was much closer than any of our forces that we were going to send there. And Castro could have loaded that place up with his people, and then you really would have had a war. How much consultation with Congress did you do, or did you feel any was necessary, or why? I, I couldn't take time? the chance. Couldn't take the I chance. didn't even tell our press secretary <laughs> that, that what we were going to do. But as of the night that our forces, incidentally, she, our commanders of the military branches, only had 48 hours to put the operation together. And then, when our forces were on their way down there, then I called, I invited the leaders of Congress to the White House and told the leaders of Congress what we were doing and why. I have always felt wherever an American citizen in the world is being denied his constitutional rights, I think that this government has a responsibility to go to his aid. The critics who believed that Congress was not sufficiently brought in on the Grenada decisions referred to the War Powers Act, a resolution to give legislators more influence on military action, in fact, a curb on the president's war-making powers. Uh, in your time, you had the Boland Amendments, yes. various versions of it, uh, to contend with the War Powers Resolution, uh, yes. that uh, uh, supposedly uh, would require Congress participation in yeah. the use of force. Yeah, but that has some parts in it, too, yeah. that are... Uh, we understand that only Congress can declare war, but we understand also that War Powers Act does have some unusual restraints well, that have never before been imposed on presidents. Lincoln could not have done what he did with regard to the Civil War had the War Powers Act been invoked. How do you define when you go to Congress to get authority? Did you have any rules that you followed? How does a president do that? Because it certainly does spell it out in the Constitution that well, the U.S. Congress should declare war. Yes, but there are some things in which uh, the president, uh, uh, he doesn't have as much now, but had power to use. He's the commander-in-chief of the military. He is personally responsible for national security. Now, there were instances in which uh, as commander-in-chief, the president could do something that was not a declaration of war, but was the actual use of military power. How did this apply to the bombing of Libya? And as a matter of fact, before that, when you sent forces into the Gulf of Sidra and you shot down a couple of Libyan planes, and then finally the bombing. Well, all right. You know that there was a terrorist attack on an airport, and civilians were mowed down by the terrorists including an 11-year-old American girl. Forces killed some of them and captured some. And we found some passports from these people, all of whom had come from Libya. But some of the people had passports that had been taken away from workers in Libya who had left Libya and, and been kicked out of Libya and their passports taken away from them, these terrorists were carrying those passports. Well, this had to make this an official act of Libya, not just a little group of terrorists. And uh, I decided there had to be a retaliation, but it also had to be secret. I turned to uh, an airstrike with orders that the targets picked out should be military. We didn't want casualties among civilians. There were some because of a misdirected missile, but the, the attack was extremely successful. And uh, you've noticed that there haven't been any repeats of that kind of Mr. Gaddafi has been the... rather quiet. Uh, Mr. President, there was speculation at that time that you actually targeted Gaddafi. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yeah, we knew the places where he was supposed to be and could be, and uh, they became targets. President Reagan's struggles with Congress over military policies and spending had a direct bearing on ideology. 
For him, the Cold War still raged. When you came into power, uh, the confrontation with the Soviet Union was full-blown still. You called the Soviet Union an evil empire. You had yeah. some uh, harsh things to say. You were called a, a cowboy, a Western cowboy, reckless. I said things like uh, that it was an evil empire uh, on purpose. I wanted them to know that uh, uh, I was not uh, being fooled or anything by them, that I had a, a set feeling about them. And here we were with our Congress uh, cutting back all the time on uh, defense spending. And uh, at the same time that the Soviet Union was going wild in its, in its buildup of military, not only nuclear weapons, they passed us. They didn't have any to begin with. And they passed us with them, but also in their conventional weapons, tanks, artillery, and so forth, that they, they outnumbered us. So I wanted them to know that I wasn't fooled about them, that I knew what they were. I thought the only answer in that Cold War was peace through strength. Was that huge buildup necessary? That was a huge change in, uh, in our defensive structure. And it was a deliberate change. And you felt the authority under the yes. Constitution as Commander-in-Chief. No, no shooting war. This is a Cold War now, but you had that authority. That was worth it? That was necessary oh, yes. as you look back? Yes, it absolutely was. When I took office, mm -hmm. I found it out that on any given day, not only 50% of our military aircraft couldn't fly for lack of spare parts, but 50% of our naval vessels couldn't leave port, either for that reason or for lack of crew. But the president also considered another way to build up the nation's defenses the Strategic Defense Initiative, a high-tech space-age system nicknamed Star Wars. He went to his Joint Chiefs of Staff with the idea. I needed to know from them whether this was a practical thing to do and whether they thought, in their judgment, that yes, technology could produce uh, such a weapon. And they, they came back to me after consulting on it and said yes, and then I turned to the scientific field, and uh, they picked it up. Do you have any regrets about that as you look no. back? You thought it was a... Oh, a and I think, it's, I think it's the best chance we have yet of ridding the world of those weapons. Because the price for giving this to other countries would be their willingness to eliminate their arsenals of nuclear weapons just as I've always thought that this is what we should do. If we've once got that and we know that we can defend ourselves from nuclear attack, I'd be in favor of us eliminating nuclear weapons. Let's take Reykjavik, which was probably the most controversial of your summit meetings. Uh, your interpretation of that, because you said you felt that was a very important moment in the in yes. this matter of reducing nuclear weapons, even though you couldn't reach an agreement in that. Well, the funny thing was, we were reaching an agreement. Uh, the last day, it was only supposed to be a morning meeting, and then we were to come home. Uh, George Schultz and I, and Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, uh, his foreign relations man, we met, and just with our interpreters. Well, as the day went on, we were coming more and more to agreement, to where we were agreeing on the reduction of conventional weapons, on nuclear weapons, the elimination of battlefield weapons, and we were agreeing on every one of these points. And then he said to me, or to us, uh, he said, well, of course, all of this is dependent on doing away with that SDI. And I looked, I couldn't believe it. We'd spent this whole day coming into this agreement. And I said, I told you that that wasn't a bargaining chip, that, and that uh, I was willing to share that once we had developed it uh, with the world so that a madman could not come along down the line. We all know how to make those weapons and come along, make them secretly, and then blackmail the, the world. So I said, uh, no, we've got to continue with SDI. And... Uh, 
he did not give in, and that's when I got up and said to George, let's get out of here. And we walked out on him. But it had some good effects, though. You didn't part as bitter enemies. Uh, no, but I, knew. I didn't get over being mad right then. He followed me all the way to the car, and he was trying to be pleasant, and, uh, but uh, I let him know how I felt. And I have to be fair with this about Gorbachev. When he came into office, he was surprised at the economic basket case he'd inherited. And he told was, you that? He, he, yes, and it was due to the buildup in military. And that's why he was one of the first uh, Soviet leaders who was willing to actually negotiate a treaty where you'd destroy weapons you already had. And, uh, but he then set out and he knew what he had to do uh, to, uh, well, in other words, that supporting the Cold War was what was keeping him economically uh, starved. Well, my first words to him, just the two of us, together in our first meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. I told him that we could try to eliminate the causes of mistrust between us, or the alternative would be to resume an arms race. And then I looked him right in the eye and said, that's a race you can't win. There is no way we're going to allow you to maintain a superiority of weaponry over us. Dangers of direct confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union diminished in the latter stages of the Cold War. The competition became indirect. In what was called the Reagan Doctrine, the United States supported anti-communist forces in the Third World, in Afghanistan, Angola, Cambodia, Nicaragua. How justified was that? Uh, the operations in I think Nicaragua. completely justified because there was a there was a revolution against Somoza the dictator of Nicaragua the revolutionaries were uh, were in there fighting to get rid of him and then they sent a message to the organization of American states to which we all belong that would they the organization ask Somoza to step down to end the killing and the Organization of American States sent a message back and said, what are your revolutionary goals? Well, back they came, they were pure de democracy. They were freedom of the press. They were uh, freedom of speech. They were everything that we have and respect in, in our country. And so we sent the message. And Somoza said it will save lives, yes. And he stepped down. When Somoza stepped down and the revolution therefore was over, suddenly the Sandinista group, which was a communist organization, they started getting rid of the leaders and high-ranking officers among their revolutionary forces who were not members of their group. Some of them were executed, some of them were exiled. Well, the Sandinistas then publicly declared that the revolution was not just limited to their boundaries, they were going to carry it beyond their boundaries until the, all the other countries were like they were, which was communist. And so the, the people began forming a, a group to defend themselves, and these were called the Contras as against this situation. And um, we thought that as freedom fighters, uh, they deserved uh, our help. What kind of help did you uh, feel that you could give? The help was uh, providing them with money and weapons and so forth so they could fight back. Do you feel today, because you're still harshly criticized about our operation down there, do you feel that's unfair? Oh, yes. Because this, then all the things like the Bolin Amendment and everything that was to curb any further help to these other revolutionaries who really wanted what they thought was their goal, the democracy, not another dictator state. The Boland Amendment, passed by Congress, restricted spending for the overthrow of the communist Nicaraguan government. It was later alleged that millions of dollars were earmarked for the Contras anyway, in a complex deal involving Iranians and weapons. 
This raised suspicions that the president was violating his own declared policy of not dealing with terrorists. But the president insisted that Americans were not dealing with the terrorist leadership in Iran, but with a dissident, more moderate group within that government. The things that were put in the press on the basis of one little weekly paper in Lebanon that was the one that published a story that we were uh, trading arms for hostages and so forth. And uh, the rest of the press picked it up and just, and, and is still going with it. No, there was nothing of the kind. We had a covert operation there because some people in Iran with the death imminent of Khomeini, and there were groups all over that were looking forward to the day when they were going to try to be in charge of government there. But I sent a word back down to our people that we had a policy of not doing business with anyone who, or any government, that was protective of terrorism. Well, back came a message from our people that these people proved to them that they were anti-terrorist. So I sent a word back then and said, remarked about the Hezbollah and the, our hostages that were held by them, and said that I knew that the Hezbollah had a kind of a, a kinship with the government of Iran. And so I said, all right, we'll make this one shipment to them if they will use their influence as Iranians to try and get our hostages freed from the Hezbollah. The hostages were really at the center of this, yes. weren't they? Now, this was not a trade of arms for hostages. This, I wasn't dealing with any government or anything. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, we had a hostage released by the Hezbollah. Sure. And a short time later, we had a second one released. And we're told there would be two more within 48 hours. The next two never came because in the interim, that newspaper over there blew that false story out. And there it was, that false story. And we had already gotten our check, these people, for the tow missiles. We didn't give them. They, were, they wanted to buy them. We had gotten our check. But when our attorney general started looking to see, with all this now in the press and going on, if there was anything that was a, could be a smoking gun in this, and came to me and said he'd found one paper, one memorandum, that suggested that there was extra money over and above our, the check that we got in a Swiss bank account. And it was a Swiss bank account that had been used for funneling money to the Contras over here in Central America. Well, I said, well, see what you can find out about this. And you still feel at this point you were unjustly accused and still well, are. Yes, because I told the truth, as I say, to the press, to the Congress leaders, to the people of what it was we were doing. And none of that has ever been accepted by the press. They went on with their story that I was trading arms for hostages, and I was doing business with Khomeini. And uh, <laughs> to this day, you know, I don't know whether the people we were dealing with, once that came out, I don't know whether they're still alive or not. Would you take that risk again, looking back? Was it worth it? Because it hurt your presidency a good deal. Yes. When it went well, wrong. No, I'd, I had never anticipated any such distortion of truth as was taking place, but now that I know the truth could be distorted, <laughs> I would be a little more careful. Could you be a little more specific? What are some of the things that you might have changed? Well, the, uh, the people on the committee, Ollie North and uh, Admiral Poindexter, uh, I wish now, they, they immediately resigned when this whole thing blew, I wish now that uh, before letting them go, I had called them in and pumped them on some of the things that I still don't know. As for example, who, who then delivered uh, those missiles from Israel where we couldn't fly them into uh, uh, Iran because that would blow the covertness of this and expose the people we were dealing with, but I never knew that. And 
see if I could find out why was there extra money. All we ever asked for was the actual cost of those weapons, which was $12.2 million. And uh, the then turning up that there were several million dollars more in, a, in another bank account that had come from the sale of those, who raised that price? And, uh, and uh, I could have found out more, perhaps, if uh, I had asked. Well, do you feel the system let you down? I mean, I'm talking about the National Security Council structure, the uh, CIA, these people who are involved in various ways. Uh, was that a failure there? Well, well no, because, uh, as I say, this was held down to the most minimum of people. Uh, to know about it because of the need for secrecy in that. And um, it wasn't secrecy because we're doing anything wrong. It was secrecy to save people's lives. One of the things, Mr. President, you raise in this, of course, is once again the power of the president to conduct foreign policy as he would like. In this, you imply the media had an extraordinary role. And I think that's the old founding fathers didn't understand that uh, when they no, built the Constitution. No. Uh, do you feel the media is too powerful? Well, they're too irresponsible. They've got a responsibility of truth that they must stick to. Uh, I once, back in my school days, uh, took a course in journalism and learned that one of the most important things was supposed to be that you could guarantee that what you said was true. Well, that has gone out the window long ago. Why? Well. I think just in the competition of the press with each other, somebody gets a story uh, that he knows will make head and eye news and everybody will talk about it, uh, never mind whether it is responsible or whether it is, is true. Look at the war in Vietnam and the stories from out of there uh, that were actually stories that were revealing to the enemy military secrets that uh, were destructive to our forces or our purpose. And the same was true uh, uh, in other incidents. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I had to get on the phone to the head of another state while I was president, and on the basis of a story that had been told, and the usual thing, sources unknown, uh, you know, th that couldn't be named, I had to get on the air and say to this other head of state, listen, this is another one of those <laughs> leaked so-called secrets. Well, now the press, Mr. President, would say, wait, the First Amendment guarantees us absolute freedom. Do you feel they've, uh, they've gone too far in invoking the First Amendment on all of these issues? Well, yes, because the, the very fact that there are some things that are national security. And should take the precedence. The security of all the people should take precedent over that uh, freedom that's yes. guaranteed. Mr. President, uh, you had few press conferences, but they were quite major affairs. Would you handle it that way again, if you could go back? Uh, I mean, do you have enough, do you think, or? Yes, I... You've got a good deal of criticism, as you know, for not seeing the press formally enough. Well, I know. <laughs> but, but again, the, uh, the press conferences were, I thought, uh, did not serve the purpose they were created for. Uh, actually, there was an adversarial relationship. And uh, I wasn't asked legitimate uh, public relations things or things that the people should know. Uh, they, they were adversarial questions. They were, they were putting me on, in a position of self-defense a number of times. We would send out around the country and bring in news editors from all over the country, not the Washington Press Corps. Well, I have to tell you, the difference between their questions and the Washington Press Corps was just unbelievable. They were asking legitimate questions for news and of interest that would be of interest to their people, not this hostile type of thing. And I enjoyed those press conferences very much. What about the idea of a single subject press conference? Is that a possibility? 
I think it could be done if it was some, uh, you know, very controversial issue or some problem that had to be met uh, and required uh, something of an unusual decision. Uh, uh, yes, I could, I could see that. When the nation's air controllers walked off their airport jobs, President Reagan showed that he could be a tough boss. It is for this reason that I must tell those who fail to report for duty th this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. Let's go to jail. The 13,000 members of a union were also federal government employees. One of the acts in the, very earlier in your presidency that startled everybody was your firing of the air controllers. I wonder if you'd tell us a little of why you did that, because it was such a departure from the normal commission to study the problem. These were public servants. Uh, they'd served well. Uh, then suddenly they decide to go on strike, and you fired them. Yeah, and I'm a lifetime member of the American Federation of Labor, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a gold card, a uh, solid gold card for six years as president of the Screen Actors Guild, and so forth, so it was strange of me, wasn't it? Well, I have always thought that an unappreciated president was Calvin Coolidge, and Coolidge is a man who laid down a law that public employees, government employees, could not strike. Because it wasn't a case of arguing about the division of money between an employer and an industry, a private industry, or what is a fair salary for a worker. You are striking against the people of the United States if you are a government employee. And uh, he'd taken that position once, and I admired him for it. But also, the air controllers had all signed a personal agreement that they would never strike. And then they turned around and violated their own pledge. And I thought they had it coming. One afternoon after President Reagan made a speech at a Washington hotel, a young man named John Hinckley Jr. standing on the sidewalk fired six shots from a handgun. God! God! Oh! President Reagan was among the four who were wounded. The question arose, who had temporary custody of the office? Let's go to the matter of disability. Twice in your presidency, when you were shot, taken to the hospital, this matter of turning over power, uh, came up also when you had your operation, uh, cancer operation. Now, the first time, there wasn't time to sign an agreement with George Bush. Were you satisfied the way that worked out? Yes, but y you must understand that that whole thing uh, during disabilities and so forth, that is actually related to whether you're going to be <laughs> uh, knocked out uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and unconscious yes. with the, uh, while an, an operation takes place. And once you're uh, back out of the ether again, you're in charge. Mm -hmm. So that's where that comes in, that if you know you're now going to be put to sleep for an operation or something, during that period, you know, anything can happen in a few hours, uh, you officially declare him in charge. Well, were you disturbed at all in, in the shooting episode? I think it was Al Haig that startled people again when he came up before the cameras and said, I'm in command. As of now, I am in control here in the White House, pending return of the Vice President, and in, in close touch with him. If something came up, I would check with him, of course. He said that because uh, 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 the Vice President happened to be out of town. But when the, when the Vice President came back to town, Haig still insisted <laughs> that he was in charge. Well, I have to tell you something. I may not have been in the office, but I was in charge. You were in charge. <laughs> I was over in that hospital. I knew what was going on. Thank you very much. 
The NRA believes that America's laws were made to be obeyed and that our constitutional liberties are just as important today as 200 years ago. And by the way, the Constitution does not say that government shall decree the right to keep and bear arms. The Constitution says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It has been observed with somber irony that the president who was hit by a would-be assassin's bullet belongs to the National Rifle Association, which strongly opposes most forms of gun control laws. Yet President Reagan backs one law that is quite stringent. Well, what I would like to see in gun control is what we have in California. And that is, you go down and you buy the gun and you lay down the money and the man says, come back next week, a week from now, and get your gun. And in that week, he has to submit your name and the gun that you're going to have to a board that goes into every bit of your background to find out if you're a citizen that uh, can be trusted with a gun to see whether have you ever had any uh, uh, criminal problems or anything of that kind. Uh, and I think that that is the most effective. I happen to believe the Constitution says that our people have the right to bear arms. I happen to believe in that. But I happen to believe also that we've got a right to determine the people that are unfit to carry arms. And uh, this has been resisted so much, but I find no objection with it. The constitutional power to fill vacant seats on the Supreme Court gives the president long-standing influence on our system of government. President Reagan appointed William Rehnquist as Chief Justice and three others as Associate Justices, including Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman ever. I'd made up my mind before I got there that I was going to appoint the first woman. Was that right? Yes. And uh, you managed to find her. It wasn't yes. that hard at all. Huh? And she's a darn good justice. Uh -huh. What did you want? What was your objective in the court, though? Surely you had a strategy. What I wanted were judges in the Supreme Court who interpreted the law, who did not write new laws. And uh, this was... This is quite important. Many times I thought that the court was really kind of making political decisions. And uh, I wanted a court that would be bound by the Constitution in interpreting it. And uh, I think we've been successful in that. Why appoint a woman? Why did you make up your mind before? Was it the temperament of a woman? Was it uh, just a different texture that perhaps comes from woman's reasoning, what? Well, I thought with the whole change today of women as a part of society uh, and being elected to elective offices and so forth as well, I thought that uh, they were serving as judges, that uh, they had a right to be considered. Now you had one other episode on the court, Mr. Bork, Robert Bork, who was turned down. Did you feel that your power to appoint a justice was usurped by the Congress? Did they go beyond their, what you would judge the constitutional right to advise and consent? They very much did go beyond that. You can ask almost any judge that knows, and he will tell you that Bork was probably one of the best qualified men to be on the Supreme Court of any justices in America. And it was sure or pure politics that kept him from that position. Mr. President, you emphasized your cabinet a good deal. Uh, you delegated authority. This is one of the uh, hallmarks of your presidency, delegation. Did you have any guide rules uh, that you followed on that? I just had one rule. I told them that we were going to be a little bit like a board of directors with one great difference, and that is that uh, I wouldn't take a vote. I would realize that I had to make the decision. But I wanted them to speak frankly on their views on any issue that came before us and not just leave it to the one cabinet secretary under whose jurisdiction this particular uh, problem came. 
but that I wanted the opinion of all of the cabinet members. And I wanted them to speak frankly if they objected to something. I wanted them to speak out and explain why they objected. And then I said at the end, of when I've heard all that I need to hear, I will go off on my own and make the decision based on what I have heard, pro and con. What did you look for in cabinet officers when you appointed them? What qualifications? Well, now don't laugh when I tell you. I, I wanted people who I thought were capable and successful and all of that, but I also wanted people that didn't want a job in government. I didn't want these people that were just looking and saying, hey, give me an appointment doing this or that. I wanted people that had to be talked into it as something they would do for the service of their country. President Reagan left an indelible stamp on the nation. During his eight years in office, the economy bounced back and the Cold War with the Soviet Union began to thaw. He made Americans more aware of those old-fashioned virtues and traditions which dated back to Ronald Reagan's youth in Illinois. His years as an actor gave him the ability to communicate, an important trait for a president. In that sense, Franklin Roosevelt was a great actor. Herbert Hoover was not. Was Ronald Reagan's professional acting experience helpful to the Reagan presidency? Your whole strength in acting is the reaction of the people. Your whole job in being in a picture and so forth is to please the people that are going to spend their money to come in and see that picture. And um, I think that that was a large part of it. Uh, I ran into an awful lot of people in, in politics and in public office who kind of resented the people they didn't like the idea of having to please someone and those people having some control over what they did. As you know, when I took office, I discovered some quite unusual things there. The double-digit inflation, the double-digit interest rates, the double-digit unemployment and so forth. I would hope that we can get back to where we realize that this system of ours established two centuries ago is one in which the people in public office are really the servants of the people. Ours is one of the only constitutions in all the constitutions of the world in which it is not a document with the government telling the people what they're privileged to do. It's a document in which we, the people, tell the government what it can do. That belief, held so firmly by Ronald Reagan from the start of his political career, is undoubtedly one reason that the American people kept him in the White House for two terms. <laughs>